power beauty in China's last dynasty was an exhibition I curated in 2018, partnering with the critically acclaimed artist, theatrical director, Robert Wilson. In this presentation, I will share with you my experience of curating this exhibition, how this first of its kind collaboration between a curator and the renowned theatrical designer came about and resulted in a very innovative approach to exhibition stage craft. I will start with um, uh, this question, why we wanted to do this exhibition. As uh, you all know that MIA, the Minneapolis Institute of Art, uh, is one of the finalist uh, encyclopedic museums in this country with one of the best Asian art collection. The museum has one of the best collections of Chinese art outside of China as well, numbering over 7,000 objects. Among the Asian art galleries, which occupy a fifth of mere gallery space, there are 15 galleries of Chinese art. Here are some uh, gallery views. This is uh, the bronze gallery. As you probably uh, would agree that uh, uh, Mia's collection of Chinese archaic bronze uh, is one of the best in this country. Uh, here is a gallery dedicated to the art of the Han Dynasty and the Buddhist uh, sculpture court. Now, in this gallery, you see several uh, masterpieces. The sarcophagus in the center, which uh, uh, dates to the uh, Northern Wei Dynasty. Um, then you also see a, a set of 10 uh, San Cai glazed figures uh, on the background. That is uh, probably the very rare or probably the only set, complete set uh, of the San Cai uh, figures. Um, from uh, uh, one bureau. This is the painting gallery. And uh, very uniquely, uh, this museum uh, collect uh, very interesting and important architectural materials, including this um, Qing Dynasty uh, scholar's studio. Uh, you will also see that the uh, studio has a uh, wonderful collection of uh, hardwood furniture. This is, uh, of course, had nothing to do with the uh, room that we, uh, Mia collected separately. So um, as the Wall Street Journal uh, review of this exhibition said uh, in the article, but in a well-loved museum, even the most dazzling pieces can become overly familiar. So Mia decided to present its treasures in a fresh way, giving visitors a more theatrical experience of the imperial court of the Qing dynasty. Um, one of the strategy plan uh, of the time when we did this exhibition was a fueling curiosity to connect our rich collections of Asian art to the audience in an uh, innovative way and uh, to create rich content that is compelling and uh, seductive to our diverse community. Uh, it is with this goal in mind that we presented this exhibition drawn from our rich collection of art created during China's last dynasty, the Qing dynasty, which lasted from 1644 until 1912. Mia's world-class collection of Chinese art provided opportunities. Mia's collection of Chinese art are particularly strong in objects from the Qing dynasty. The permanent collection holds over 2000 objects from this period, ranging from rare cut costumes and jade to hardwood furniture, porcelains, lacquerwares, and gold ornaments, etc. And we are very lucky to have donors who believed in our collections of Asian art and have specifically donated funds that allow us to better uh, interpret 
and display these materials, including a six million request from Alfred Gale for an unprecedented long-term initiative to create innovative public programs, special exhibitions, and a new scholarship dedicated to Asian arts. So Robert Wilson, a theatrical director, designer, and artist is best known for Einstein on the Beach, his groundbreaking 1976 collaboration with composer Philip Glass. He remains active in the art world since then, and he happens to be a passionate collector of Chinese art. With his innovative creativity in theater and vision art, his understanding of Chinese philosophy and aesthetic, Robert Wilson was the best person to design an appropriately theatrical set for this exhibition. Here we have some pictures from uh, the operas that uh, Robert Wilson involved. All the pictures are so stunning and innovative. So this is an exhibition, Power Beauty in China's Last Dynasty. As the exhibition title indicated, the exhibition was about China's last dynasty, the Qing Dynasty, its imperial power and beauty in art. The Qing Dynasty was established by the Manchu in 1644. Powerful and ambitious, the dynasty lasted for more than 250 years. It enjoyed a fantastic wealth in its apogee. The court commissioned and collected the countless artworks of exceptional craftsmanship. The exhibition showed an unparalleled prosperity of arts that flourished in the pinnacle of the Qing Empire, including textiles, jades, gold, ornaments, porcelain, lacquerwares, and furniture pieces, and created an immersive experience designed to evoke the mysterious realm of the Qing court. The installation was an experience completed with sights, sounds, special lighting, and smells. Objects were arranged in thematical progression of 10 galleries, including the following scenes. Darkness, prosperity, order and hierarchy, the common man, fearsome authority, Buddhist art, Taoist art, court ladies and noble women, mountains of the mind, lightness. Here is the floor plan of the special exhibition space. So you will start from uh, gallery one, then to two, then towards the left to three and four, then you go to the south to number five. And the number six or seven is just on the both side of uh, room five. Then you have to go back to four, then uh, towards the left to room eight, then nine, then 10 uh, exit. This is the entrance to the exhibition. Uh, we have a very beautiful Chinese calligraphy uh, enlarged and painted in, on wall in red. The title wall in Chinese was uh, written by renowned Chinese calligrapher, uh, Professor Wang Dongling uh, at the um, China Academy of Arts based in Hangzhou, uh, Zhejiang province. Now, here is the first room entitled the Darkness. In the West, darkness evokes evil and depression, but in ancient Chinese philosophy, Taoism in particular, it can suggest the original meaning that sometimes dark is difficult to see. Darkness is the opposite or contrary force of the bright. A dark room at the beginning of the exhibition, accompanied by a piano piece by John Cage and the sound of dropping chopsticks, 
thus provides a visitor a moment to meditate and empty him or herself. The only object in this room, a dark blue glazed vase of the Qing Dynasty with a simple, elegant and a geometric form helps to create emptiness in visitor, a state of mind characterized by simplicity and uh, quietude. As this picture shows, uh, the room was turned into a soundproof space. I would like to share with you this uh, very brief uh, video clip. Uh, Room two, prosperity. A visitor would then be astonished by fullness in this next room, a massive display of some 200 artifacts from the Qing dynasty, a symbol of the Qing material culture in its full bloom. Some hundred objects were in the cases and the rest showed on wall as pictures. The sun check composed by the American music producer, Hall Wilner, the collage of old women, reinforced the idea of uh, prosperity. Here we have more pictures of this room. I would like to share this uh, very brief uh, video clip uh, with you again. Room three, order and hierarchy. Here is the floor plan. You see that room three. A display of five imperial robes mounted on stands placed on a rectangular low platform in the center that hides a line of light underneath. Robes were presented parallel to each other in a strict order a symbol of imperial order and hierarchy. The walls were mounted with a straws to form sharp contrast and a set of the delicacy of the imperial robes. The sound of a sticker slaps reinforced the idea of such rigid social hierarchy. Here is a very brief video clip. Number four, the common man. Here is the uh, floor plan. You will see that room four is actually located in the center of entire exhibition space. In this room, a tiny bronze figure was accompanied only by the innocent singing and the giggling of a child. Amid the prosperity of the Qing dynasty, this long statue made some 2000 years earlier during roughly Confucius time, suggests the ancient Chinese philosophy of governance in which primacy was given to the people. Chinese rulers believed that their right to rule was divinely granted, but heaven granted or withdrew this authority according to the welfare of the people. If an emperor was cruel and oppressive towards his subjects, it was said that he lost his right to rule and it would be topped. As Xing's uh, third century BCE Confucius philosopher 
once said, the ruler is the boat and the people are the water. It is the water that holds up the boat and the water that capsizes it. Here's a video clip of this room. The next room is a feel some authority. From the, this floor plan, you will see uh, that room five is just the opposite of number four. Within this room, an imperial throne was placed on a raised platform surrounded by pillars and dragons painted on walls. The walls, floor, and the raised platform were painted red and the pillars gold. Both throne and the dragon conveyed imperial fearsome authority and it was reinforced by the soundscape of uh, ceremonial music, which was intermittently interrupted by a man's scream, a symbol of the cruelness of the ruler. So on both sides of this room, uh, uh, there's a, a room dedicated to Buddhist art on the right-hand side. Here you can see number six. Amid the chant of a Buddhist sutra, five Buddhist statues st stood on high pedestals, demanding visitors to look up to see them. Walls and floors were lined up or lined with stainless steel panels to create a cold and otherworldly autumn sphere. As you all know, that uh, in China, in Imperial China, religions and politics have always in, intertwined in China with rulers using religion's devotion to reinforce their reign. So on the other side of the room dedicated to the authority, fearsome authority was the room uh, dedicated to Taoist art. Within this room, that's number seven, uh, next to the room number five. Within this room, three Taoist painting of Tianzun, the uh, supreme deities of the Taoist pantheon were displayed in the center of this room. The wall and the floors were mounted with dried mud to create a cave-like setting that evokes the sol solitary mountain retreats of Taoist practitioners. The sound of uh, water drips, stick slaps, and the temple bells further reinforced the idea of other worldliness.
Next room is uh, court ladies and noble women. So we have to walk back to number four, then uh, turn to number eight. In this room, a display of several dozens of artifacts associated with the noble women visualizes the life of inner quarter, a uh, counterbalance to the public court life. Walls were lined with myla to create a kind of a dramatic setting. In male-dominated Chinese imperial society, women were the counterpoint to men existing only in relation to them. In classical Chinese literature, the attributes of refinement, delicacy, and fragmency, fragments are shared by both flowers and women. A song from Puccini's Toronto is suggestive of Chinese women's melancholy life. Next room is Mountains of the Mind. The large jade mountains was displayed by finely woven landscape hand scroll. You can see that the jade mountain and a hand scroll in the center. The walls of the room were clad with a mountain scapes created by contemporary Chinese artist named Yang Yongliang. It was accompanied by Chinese music instruments known as Gu Qing or Ziza, uh, lofty mountains and uh, running streams, uh, Gao Shan Liu Sui, and uh, thunder. Centuries of uh, accumulated religion, history, literature, and uh, folklore have built up China's mountainscape, mountains into divine realms. Rulers and courtiers alike dreamed of retreating from society into a life of seclusion in the mountains, an escape that remained hypothetical. The digital manipulated landscape by the contemporary artist Yang Yongliang that superimposed scenes of modern urban life over images of modern, uh, uh, over images of mountains speaks and waterfalls capture that time-tested dilemma of mundane society and the otherworldliness. Now we'll come to the last room, room nine, um, lightness. Dark is forever balanced by light. In ancient China, the yin and the yang forces that make up all aspects and a phenomena of life are traditionally depicted as the light and the dark halves of a circle. Here, the darkness of the exhibition's first room was complemented in this final gallery by um, glowing walls lit from within, a white floor and a Mughal style pale green jade vase 
commissioned by the Ying Qing court. The sound of waves against the rocks suggested the wave pattern, so-called li shui, along the borders of imperial robes, a final reference to the power and beauty of Qing period, China's last dynasty. The song known as Happy Chappy was suggestive of the end of the experience. I'm happy as can be, tra la 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 li, as happy as a chappy can be, like the bird. So what was special in this exhibition? It was not a museum exhibition in the usual sense. The mod, no much high tech tricks were involved in the installation. It was an experience completed with sight, sounds, colors, special lighting, the smells. Some galleries contained many objects. Three galleries held only one each. And the two galleries, and the two, in, in uh, some galleries, uh, objects were obscured. Walls were lined with a special printed paper, mylar, straw, stainless steel panels, and a dry mud. Through the use of dramatic elements like lighting, soundscape, progression, juxtaposition, contrasts, symmetry, or balance, the exhibition let the visitor feel as though they were part of this exquisite, intoxicating, and sometimes fearful and even otherworldly world. What is missing? What was missing were labels and the didactics except a very brief introduction at the entrance. Wilson said that if you go to a gallery or a museum that has labels, the first thing people do is to is bend over and read the labels before they look at objects. What you experience is what most important. Thus, rather than exp explanatory text for each object, lengthening timelines of major historical uh, moments and the contextual photographs the exhibition presented treasures in a really fresh way, giving visitor a more theatrical and immersive experience of the Qing imperial power and the beauty in art. A visitor was offered a brochure at the beginning that describes the theme of exhibition and the installation of each gallery, as well as uh, the key objects of each gallery. Dozens were around, but only as the visitors exited. Information on the objects on view were available in Mir's website. If one would like to learn more about Chinese art in general or art from China's last dynasty, he or she would visit the 15 galleries in the museum. So what can this exhibition, uh, uh, this is the uh, brochure that we provided, uh, uh, we created and provided to visit uh, to page uh, with a uh, uh, explanation of a brief ex ex uh, uh, explanation of some key objects. So um, what this exhibition can bring about Power Beauty was the most imaginative exhibition design to date at Mir, thanks to the collaboration of Mir team and Robert Wilson. The staging and the storytelling involved in this exhibition spoke to Mir's belief in art's ability to inspire wonder and a full um, fuel curiosity, our willingness to push the boundaries and the unique approach to the design made this exhibition really unprecedented. The exhibition installation, which involved the sound, smell, and a dramatic contrast, 
brightness and darkness, fullness and emptiness brought a new perspective to this historical objects created during China's last dynasty. Thank you very much.